This introduction is a very brief overview of the EtherCAT field bus protocol, which is relatively complex. There is a wealth of documentation available online, and links to these sites are provided at the end of this section. The purpose of these slides is to provide the user with a frame of reference for understanding EtherCAT technology, capabilities, and issues, and to serve as a good launching off point for further study of the protocol. EtherCAT is an Ethernet-based field bus standard targeted at real-time requirements for automation. It is designed to achieve very low update or cycle times, typically less than 100 microseconds, with low jitter less than 1 microsecond. Physically, the nodes of an EtherCAT network can be connected in a number of configurations as illustrated in the diagram at the upper left. Logically, all the slaves are daisy-chained together and operate on a single loop. The diagram on the right highlights the two differential pairs present in a CAT5 Ethernet cable, which allows for both outgoing and incoming paths, from the master's perspective, within the same cable. This means a PC operating as the EtherCAT master needs only one Ethernet port to address up to 64,000 nodes. Two ports are needed only if redundant cabling is required. Inside an EtherCAT slave node, there are four ports, with the input port being designated as port 0. Incoming data flows to each port in turn, in the sequence 0, 3, 1, 2. If a given port is not connected externally, for example, ports 1 to 3 in this diagram, an internal switch is closed, allowing the data to continue flowing to the next port and ultimately back to port 0 to begin its return trip to the EtherCAT master. In a two-port system, port 1 is considered the output port, which is connected to slave nodes downstream in the chain. EtherCAT slave devices read the process data that is addressed to them and insert return data on the fly as the datagram passes through. The size of a datagram is very flexible and can contain data for the entire network of slave nodes. The amount of data targeted at each node can vary widely, from a single bit up to 60 kilobytes. Additionally, the structure of process data can change for each datagram, enabling short data intervals for access control updates and longer intervals for block data updates. Asynchronous event-triggered communication is also possible. By adding a second Ethernet port on the master, EtherCAT can provide cable redundancy. This example shows redundant data being transmitted on the second Ethernet port. The data is an exact copy of that being transmitted on the first master port. But the second port's data is never used by the slaves unless a line break is detected. If a line failure does occur, in this case just after slave number two, then the associated loopback switches, circled here, will close, thereby completing separate loops and allowing the master to detect the failure while maintaining full communications to all nodes. We've just covered the physical layer of an EtherCAT network, and now we switch to the underlying structure of the Ethernet frames that are transmitted over that network. This is the data link layer in the OSI network model. We won't try to cover all the details of the underlying frame structure in this video. Rather, we are covering just enough to support debugging of common errors that result when configuring a network. Within a standard Ethernet frame, there are one or more EtherCAT datagrams that are carried in the payload section. Each datagram consists of a header, which contains the command, address, length, and various check bits to ensure the integrity of the network, the data to be transmitted, and a working counter, or WKC, 
the working counter indicates the number of transactions carried in the datagram. As the datagram makes its way through the EtherCAT slave nodes, each node that is addressed by that datagram will in turn increment this counter. If the WKC field in the frame returned to the master does not match what's expected, then an error somewhere in transmission or network nodes has been detected. This picture shows how the master manages the whole network with a single packet and address space. EtherCAT provides a very simple, unified view of the slaves in a single memory map, thereby simplifying the control system. Various types of data can be grouped together and can be associated with multiple slave devices. For example, PLC data from remote IOs and drives are grouped in one datagram. The master will address them all with a single command. The slaves take the individual frames and use the FMMU or Field Bus Memory Management Unit to map data from the master's 4 gigabyte logical process image or memory map to individual objects in the slave's memory space. Each slave has multiple FMMUs each providing a different mapping of logical process image to slave objects. This means that successive datagrams can have different mappings of slave node to the master process image. The individual addresses of each slave node can be in any order specified by the master, and there are a number of methods of assigning addresses, namely auto-increment, a position-based method where nodes are assigned an address starting from zero and decrementing for each location in the chain. This method is the simplest and can be set up automatically by the master on the initial network configuration scan. Other methods include fixed physical, also called node addressing, which is also assigned during configuration scan, and whose addresses can be independent of their physical location in the network. Finally, there is logical addressing which provides a 32-bit address rather than the 16-bit address of the other modes. Note that the 64K limit on node count in a network still applies. One of the most powerful features of EtherCAT for real-time control is the distributed clocks unit. I.O. activities can be triggered from master cycle timing or local clocks in each slave. These local clocks can be synchronized to a reference clock in the system, which is either the master's clock or the first slave in the system. Since the EtherCAT master may typically have higher jitter and delay compared to the slave nodes, the first slave is more commonly used as the reference. In both cases, the master is managing the measurement of delay and drift in the system through a clock synchronization process outlined in the box at the right. Through a repeating series of clock sync packages, the master determines the required offset for each slave to ena enable it to maintain a clock with jitter and delay much less than 100 nanoseconds. In the above example, an EtherCAT network is configured to measure jitter and latency between two nodes with 300 nodes and a total of 120 meters of cable length between them. This oscilloscope screen capture shows the results that can be achieved. Most ESCs, or EtherCAT slave controllers, use 100 megahertz timers, which results in an absolute minimum jitter of plus or minus 10 nanoseconds. Actual system performance in this example shows a jitter of plus or minus 20 nanoseconds with average delay between the clocks of only 15 nanoseconds. 
These low jitter clocks can be used to generate events in the slave controller to trigger analog I.O. conversions and digital captures, control outputs, and interrupt the CPU with precise timing, enabling highly accurate real-time control across a large area and a large number of control points. In the next video segment of this series, we will cover the hardware used in building an EtherCAT slave. More information on TI C2000 EtherCAT solution, TIDM Delfino EtherCAT, can be found at the TI design link given here. Additional details of EtherCAT technology, software, and hardware are available on the ETG and Beckoff sites. Thanks for watching.